Uh, Richard Watson is going to be teaching a class here in the auditorium uh, that's called Conversations uh, with God. It's a class on prayer, as you might guess uh, from that title, but Richard is not able to be here uh, tonight, and so what we decided to do is to take uh, the class uh, that I'm going to be teaching in Adult 1 and 2, uh, and just for tonight's uh, purposes to move that class in here uh, and to teach that class in here tonight, uh, and then this class on... Uh, uh, we'll move into adult one and two next week, and Richard's class on uh, conversations with God will start in here uh, next week. So, um, y'all remember the commercial, or was it some kind of advertisement about got milk? Was that, uh, you remember that? I mean, that, to me, that was one of the more effective uh, marketing schemes because you remember it, right? And then once they did, I think that was the first got whatever was got milk. And then once they did got milk, everybody else wanted to do a got something. Uh, and so, uh, so we're, we're just gonna, we're just gonna jump on that bandwagon and say, okay, you got wisdom. I mean, I, milk's important. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, we're going to get some on the way home tonight because milk is important. But before we go and get some milk on the way home tonight, we want to stop and get some wisdom first. Do you have wisdom? You got wisdom? What we're going to be doing is we're going to be studying in a topical way, uh, the book of Proverbs. Uh, we're not going to be studying what I mean topical way. We're not going to be studying a verse by verse, going through it chapter by chapter. Uh, but we're going to be looking at just some various topics uh, that we can see through the, book of, uh, through the book of Proverbs. Because what you have in the book of Proverbs are some eternal principles. I want you to think about this. The book of Proverbs was written 3,000, roughly, 3,000 years ago. Is that a long time? Yeah. 3,000, does it still have any application to, I mean, something that old. I mean, that's, that's got to be so archaic that it has nothing to do with anybody any longer, right? Um, does it still have application today? The principles that we find in the book of Proverbs are eternal principles that, that provide us with just guidelines on how to live. Um, the, the book of Proverbs, if if, if you look at how the Old Testament is divided, you've got the books of Moses, the first five books, you've got the books of history, uh, the next 12 books, uh, skip over, you've got five books of the major prophets, you've got 12 books of the minor prophets, but that section of books that we skipped has a variety of different names. There's five books there, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. But one of the names that those five books are sometimes called is the books of wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom now. The whole Bible is a book of wisdom, but that's, that's one name that's been given to these books is because of the wisdom that we can find uh, within these books. Now, of course, our world would say, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Um, I mentioned those names. How, do, how, how many of y'all have seen uh, Princess Bride? The movie Princess Bride, how many of y'all have seen? So have you heard of Plato, Aristotle? Socrates, remember when Vizzini asked that question? What did he say about those three guys? Come on, Princess Bride people. He asked Wesley, have you heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Wesley said yes. And then Vizzini had one word to describe him. Remember what it was? What it was? Morons. Okay, there's another Princess Bride person here. Thank you. All right. So he, he described them as morons. All right? And, you know, we think of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, you know, yeah, I'd, we wouldn't necessarily describe them as morons, but what his point was was that Vicini was, Vicini was so much smarter than anybody that that's how he looked at them. Now, what about Solomon? What about his wisdom? Is it on the level of Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates? Those are the guys that are, those are, the guys that are, that are esteemed by so many people today, and yet... Here's a book that we're going to look at in the book of Proverbs, written yeah, 600 years before those wise guys uh, came along, and it has eternal principles in it that even 3,000 years later are still making a difference in people's lives. So here's, here's what I want to do tonight. I want to spend just a little time. I'm probably going to spend more time than I want to. I want to spend a little time just talking about the book of Proverbs, uh, just kind of in an introductory way. But then I, then I want to kind of uh, look down at one verse uh, as we have time near the end. But just really quick, book of Proverbs. What's a proverb? Don't say it's a book in the Bible. What's a proverb? 
a wise saying. Okay? What's a proverb? Here's some definitions for you, okay? A proverb is a short but profound saying bearing some relevant truth or practical wisdom. Short but profound. Um, and that's, that's the Hebrew word for, for proverb. That's what it means. It, it just means that there's some kind of comparison that's being made here. There's something that's similar uh, in these things. Another definition of proverbs is a short, incisive, and impressive affirmation embodying truth. Hang on, that's not, is that the one I put up there? Nope, I skipped that one. I, I, must, I decided not to put that one up there. Here's the other one. A pithy sentence clearly and concisely expressing some fact, truth, concept, and idea. Think about that. Short, pithy sentence that clearly and concisely conveys some fact, truth, concept, and idea, and it thrusts it through effectively into your memory. And that's, that's kind of what, when you think about the book of Proverbs, these are eternal truths, eternal principles, but there's, many of them are said in such a way that they're very memorable. When, and and we're, going to we're going to talk about a number of those even tonight as we go through this, but you think about some of the Proverbs. Um, one of my favorite talks about a lazy man puts his hand in the bowl. And I, I don't know why, but I often think about just somebody sitting watching a game on TV or something when I read this verse in Proverbs 19, that a lazy man puts his hand into the bowl, buries his hand in the bowl, but you know why he's lazy? What does the rest of the verse say? He's not so much even bring it back to his face. That's pretty lazy, isn't it? I mean, when you're sitting there and you got cheese balls or you got popcorn or you got whatever, and you bury your hand in there, to get, but it's pretty lazy if you won't even bring it back to your mouth. That's a memorable way for God to describe to us what somebody lazy is like. What about somebody, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 17, describes, it says, uh, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man. You gain bread by deceit, oh, that's sweet, I got some bread. But afterward, his mouth will be filled with gravel. That's not, that's not what you expect it to say. And so when it has those, it, it, it helps it to stick a little bit better. Uh, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the way there, the end thereof is what? Death. You, you've, you've, heard, you've heard a number of these verses. A soft answer turns away wrath. And so there's, it, it has memorable elements that help them to, uh, to kind of stick. Uh, but that, that's what a proverb is. Do, 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 we, do we have Proverbs? Do we have Proverbs today? Not, I'm, I'm talking outside of the book of Proverbs. Do we have Proverbs today? A penny saved is a... Isn't that great? Aren't you glad you learned that? Uh, but I mean, that, that's, that's a proverb. You know, that, that's something that... Uh, who was it? Was it Benjamin Franklin uh, who said that? But you know, that's, that's a proverb where he takes some, some short, pithy statement that has some truth to it and puts it in a way that can help make it easy to remember. Um, sometimes people think this is in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to, is that in the Bible? It's not, it's not a verse in the Bible, but people are like, what? where's that in the Bible? It's not there. But uh, it was some grandmother who made that up. Uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. Uh, what is that? Short uh, statement that's got some fact to it that is easy for you to remember. So that's, now, some Proverbs are easier to remember uh, than others, but um, you know the book of Proverbs. How many chapters are in the book of Proverbs? Thirty-one. What's the most number of days that we have in any month of the year? Thirty-one. Not a bad practice just to pick up the book of Proverbs. And say, hey, what's today? Look on the calendar. It's this day. Okay, I'll I'll read that chapter in the book of Proverbs. Uh, chapters only have twenty-five to thirty verses on average. You could listen to it in the car. Uh, when you get in the car and go to work, you go to school, you can listen to a chapter in the book of Proverbs. And, and a normal reading, uh, unless you're one of those people who you know, put, pushes the button for 1.5 times or 2 times or whatever, uh, but a normal, a normal speed reading, it takes about 3.5 minutes, maybe 4 minutes for a, a person reading it to you. You got 3.5 or 4 minutes to listen to a chapter? Um, and and, and here's, here, here's, here's a great way to do it. Now, the book of Proverbs is found in this section that we call the books of wisdom, but it, 
the, another name for this section is also called the books of poetry. Um, because when you turn to this section in your Bible, depending on what translation you have, and, and it's not for every translation, but when you flip over to Psalms, and you flip over to Proverbs, flip over to Ecclesiastes, does that, just the formatting of the text, does it look different than Genesis or Exodus in your Bible? Now, not every Bible. King James is not going to be that way. Uh, American Standard, I don't think, is that way. But, so not everyone is that way. But some of the newer ones are. It does that to show you that the, that the formatting is representative of the kind of language that's being used here uh, is a different kind of, not, not a different uh, language being Hebrew, but just the writing style uh, is different here uh, in, in, in these books of poetry. Um, but just because it's poetry doesn't mean that there's not truth to be learned. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I, this is going to offend some of you, and it's going to make some of you happy. <laughs> that's, that's like a preacher thing, right? Offend people, make some people happy. Here's the thing. When I was in school, poetry was not my thing. Didn't really enjoy it, all right? See, I just offended some of you. You're like, oh, I don't like this guy anymore. And some of you are like, yeah, right on, man. I didn't like it either. So I, I don't know. I don't know who you are. Uh, but, you know, and because poetry for me was hard to understand. I was just like, why don't you just say it, man? I mean, just, just come out and say it. Don't beat around the bush. Don't put the flowery language on it. Just say what you're trying to say. Um, and, uh, you know, some husbands and wives are thinking, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's good advice. Um, but when you read the Bible books of poetry, it's not the same thing as English poetry, uh, although there, there are some, there are some similarities. Uh, but we need to understand that just because it's in the section of poetry doesn't mean there aren't truths that are being taught here. Now, are there some similarities? Are there some differences? Uh, yeah, there's similarities and there's differences between what we would think of as poetry and what we're reading in the book of Proverbs uh, as poetry. Um, obviously, both Hebrew and English poetry uses that element of imagery. Uh, it kind of draws word pictures. Um, some people have described, uh, like Solomon and uh, some of the other writers of the Old Testament, some, some people have described them like the photographers of the, of the Bible because they're painting a picture for you. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're drawing out a picture. And, th and that's what, what poetry is do doing. When you read the book of Song of Solomon, when you read the book of Song of Solomon, do you, are you seeing a, a scene played out in front of you? Are you seeing like a movie scene played out? I mean, he's drawing a picture, sometimes a very graphic picture uh, between a husband and his wife. But that, that's what's happening there is, is you have some, some very uh, clear imagery uh, as to what's going on here. But you also have some differences. Um, you don't have rhyme. You know, when we think of poetry, we think roses are red, violets are blue, um, you know, make up the, I mean, the rest of it you just make up, right? Um, but it, there's, it's, this, this poetry doesn't rhyme. And if it did rhyme, it doesn't even rhyme in Hebrew. But if it did rhyme in Hebrew, what good would that do us? Would that do us any good? Not in translation. If you don't read Hebrew, what difference would it make? So you don't have the rhyme, you don't have the same kind of meter that we would have uh, in, uh, in English poetry. But one of, the, one of the main, is this the point I've got up here? One of the main things, and we're going to have a lesson on this later for those of you who come down to the adult one and two class. But one of the main elements of Hebrew poetry is this idea of parallelism. And uh, I'm going to have a whole class on it later, but basically what that means is when you read a verse in Proverbs especially, the first part of the verse and the second part of the verse are going to play off of each other, usually. Um, and they're going to play off of each other in different ways. Um, sometimes they're going to complement each other, sometimes they're going to contrast each other, but, uh, and, and some, sometimes they're going to say the exact same thing. Um, pride goes before what? Are you sure? You've got pride, and what else is mentioned in that verse? A haughty spirit. What's the difference between pride and a haughty spirit? Is that the same thing? Pride is a haughty spirit. A haughty spirit uh, is pride. Uh, and so pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit goes before a, a fall. What's the difference between those two statements? Not a single thing. 
It's the same thing. And so a lot of times, and so don't think parallelism means they say the exact same things. It's just, the point is that they're going to play off of each other. Sometimes they're going to say the exact opposite. Does it help sometimes to say the opposite of something that you just said? Those of you who are parents know that that's the case. That if you say one thing, if you go and then say the opposite of what you just said, it helps it to sink in uh, a little bit. And so sometimes that's what you find. Uh, sometimes that's what you find there. And I'm just going to skip all of these because we're going to talk about those later and I don't have time to do it tonight. So, who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon. How do you know that? Because what? Because it says so. That's a good answer. Uh, who, wrote, uh, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Oh, we don't know. God did. We don't know the man who wrote it because it doesn't tell us. Who wrote the book of 1 John? John did. How do we know? It doesn't say that John wrote it, but we know through history that he did. So nicely, Solomon put his name in this book uh, in, in several places. Uh, and so as, as we're reading now, it's, it's not only Solomon. When you get down to the last two chapters, uh, you've got some different men writing, but Solomon writes Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, we don't know when he wrote those books. Some people suggest that he wrote Song of Solomon early, earlier in his life. He wrote the book of Proverbs kind of midlife, and then he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes near the end of his life. That one probably makes the most sense because he's reflecting back uh, on all of the things that he had tried in his life and all the things that had failed uh, in his efforts. But I know you've got Proverbs, probably Proverbs open, but flip over to 1 Kings really quick. Flip your Bible over to the book of 1 Kings. So, the book of Proverbs is in this section of the Bible called the books of wisdom, or sometimes called wisdom literature, is what that section might be called. Um, and Solomon writes three of the five books that are there, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Three of the five books on wisdom are written by this guy. What, why would that be, perhaps? Look in 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, when Solomon, is, uh, when Solomon is to be made king, look in verse 5. What did God offer to Solomon in 1 Kings 3 and verse 5? God says, ask, what shall I give you? What, what could Solomon have asked for? Anything. God just gave him a blank check. He says, what do you want? God says in verse 5, what do you want? And so Solomon was like, well, I'd like a new Porsche and a Lamborghini. Um, and uh, I would like, uh, I'd like to live a really long time. I'd like a steak dinner. Uh, I'd like uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Um, that was a dumb thing to think about, right? Uh, what did he ask for? He asked for wisdom. Of all the things that he could have asked for, and the thing that he asked for is that, uh, look in verse 9, Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. Solomon asked God to help him as a king to have wisdom. Did God give it to him? Yep. Did God give him anything else? Yep. Um, have you ever given your kids, oh, don't answer this out loud, uh, have you ever given your kids more than they asked for? Have your kids ever done something where you thought, you know what, they deserve a little bit extra? Uh, here's, here's God looking at Solomon saying, wow, look at this guy. He only, he just, he asked for wisdom from heaven. Yeah, I'm going to give that to him and, and then some. Um, and so, uh, look in the last verse, last verse of the chapter, verse 28. All Israel heard of the judgment the king had made uh, regarding the two women earlier in this, in this chapter. They feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Go into chapter 4, look at the end of chapter 4, verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largest, uh, largest of heart like the sand of the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of who? Are you with me in verse 30? 
It excelled the wisdom of everybody else. Verse 31, he was wiser than all men. There wasn't anybody who compared with Solomon. Look at verse 34. Men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. It wasn't just men. Who else came to, to check it out? Remember in chapter 10? Queen of Sheba. Queen of Sheba hears about this, and she comes, if you look in chapter 10, she actually comes to test him. She's going to ask him some hard questions. Well, if you've got all the wisdom of God, what's a hard question? There's no hard question. And so what, what, was, what, was, her, what was her evaluation of Solomon? The half has not been told. She said, I've heard about you, but they're not even telling, they're not even telling half of what, what is the truth about this. And so here's the book of Proverbs. Solomon, the, the book of uh, 1 Kings, that should say 1 Kings. I didn't put a 1 Kings there, but that should say 1 Kings. Solomon wrote in 1 Kings 4, verse 32, he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. We don't have all of those. Uh, we, don't, we barely have maybe 10, 15% of them uh, left for us. And so he did a lot of writing, uh, a lot of composing, obviously, of songs too. Uh, but, uh, but he doesn't write this whole book, but writes, writes the majority of it. Go to, Pro, go to Proverbs chapter 1. What's the purpose of this book? He tells us right at the beginning. Look in Proverbs chapter 1. Why is he writing this book? Verse 2, he's writing this book to know wisdom and instruction. That's what this is all about. Uh, that's that's a, key, a key verse here, is, is that he's writing this so that man would know the wisdom of God, that man would receive the instruction given to him by God. The rest of the verse says, to perceive the words of understanding. That may be an example of the second part of the verse saying the exact same thing as the first part of the verse. Um, but God wrote this so that man could perceive the words of understanding. God has given wisdom in this book that is practical. Think about it. 3,000 years later, it's still practical. It's intellectual, meaning there's things in here that will challenge you intellectually. It's not just, it's not just for kids. It... it, it, it it is wisdom that is moral. As you read through this book, it's going to talk about marriage. It's going to talk about parenting. It's going to talk about purity. It's going to talk about drinking. Uh, it, there, there are moral principles that are found in this book that applied 3,000 years ago that still apply today. Uh, and so as you, as you read through this book, do we think about verse 2. Does this apply to me? When I read this book, am I knowing wisdom and instruction? Am I perceiving the words of understanding that God wants me to know? Am I being informed in the ways of God and, and following the ways of God? Look at verse 3. He said that he's writing this so that those who read it can receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment. And your Bible may say equity or your Bible may say integrity. God's writing this so that they might have the wisdom to know how to make the right decisions have righteousness to be able to see the difference between right and wrong, to have justice to know how to fairly treat people, and to have equity or integrity that says, I'm going to live a life that is straight in line, that's what the word literally means, straight in line with God in my conduct, and I'm not going to live a perverse life off in my own direction. This is just going to be doing what God wants me to do. That's what the book of Proverbs helps us to do. Here's what Guy and Wood said, one more quote from him. The Proverbs teaches us faithful obedience to God and the right relationship with man are the only ways to true wisdom. When you read the book of Proverbs, to know wisdom, verse 2, and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, that's telling us we need to be in a right relationship with God, we need to be in a right relationship with man in order to truly carry out the things that are in this book. One more thing real quick, and then I want to get into uh, one verse as we have time left. Who is this book for? It's for us? Yeah, it's, it's for everybody. Uh, and it's interesting, you read through the book, and uh, how often do you read Solomon saying, my son, my son, my son? Um, have you ever written a, 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 a note, a letter? 
uh, to one of your children with, with things that you wish that they would do, uh, choices that you wish that they would make? Here's Solomon, under the inspiration of God, writing this and saying, here's what wisdom would cause you to do. And we get to kind of peek over his shoulder and read into what he's saying and say, you know what, that applies to me too. Look in verse 4, still in the first chapter here. Who, who is this being written to? He says, verse 4, this is being written to give prudence to who? The simple. Does your Bible have a different word than simple? Naive. So here's a book that's being written on a level for people who are, who are new to God, who are new to the Bible. It's being written for people that are simple just to give them some common sense because they're, they're living perhaps, uh, ju they're just inexperienced and immature when it comes to ways of the Bible. The rest of verse 4, it's being written to the young man that he might have knowledge and discretion. So he's giving him sound advice for the young man to follow. Verse 5, it's being written to the wise man so that he might hear and increase learning. Do you see the difference? Verse 4 is being written to the simple and naive, but verse 5, oh, it's also being written to the wise man. Well, then who does that leave out? If it's being written to those who don't know much and it's being written to the wise man, who does that leave out? And it's got everybody in between. It's being written for, and I love what he says in verse 5. Verse 5, it's for the wise man who will, in, who will hear and increase learning. Are there some wise people who think they are know-it-alls? If you're a know-it-all, not you, obviously, none of you, obviously, but uh, using the word you in, in a generic sense, but if you are a know-it-all, what is there that you don't know? By definition, nothing, right? If you're a know-it-all, there is nothing you don't know. Um, some of you had children when they hit the teenage years. They were know-it-alls. Uh, I was one of those teenagers. Um, one of my favorite things, uh, now that I look back at it, I hate it, but one of my favorite things that I said to my mom as a teenager was, I know, I know. Whatever she said to me, I know. Uh, you know, and I look back at, at teenage David, and I just, you know, just want to, come here, teenage David, let me, let me have a word with you, teenage David. Um, but here's a book written in the wisdom literature of the Bible that says, hey, wise man, more that you can learn. There's more that you can know. The rest of verse 5, who else? It's written for a man of understanding so that this person can attain wise counsel. So it's written for the youth, it's written for somebody who has understanding all, already, but yet to continue to give them additional guidance. Verse, five, uh, verse 6, so that they can understand a proverb, an enigma, the words of the wise, and their riddles. He says, I want you to understand everything that there is to know about God, to hear what God has to say, and to add what you already know. Here's a book. I, I hope the book of Proverbs is one of your favorite books. Um, because here's a book that just, it tells us truly in a real sense how to live. Let me make this one last comment before we look at verse 7. We're going to look at verse 7 for the rest of class. Let me make this one last comment here. When you read the book of Proverbs, and you come across a proverb, you come across a verse, is that an iron-clad guarantee truth that has no exceptions when you read it? You read something that says, well, that's the way it is. There's no exceptions to that. A soft answer turns away wrath. Does that, is that always 100% of the time the case? No. Okay. Is it most of the time the case that when you are in an argument, if you will de-escalate the argument, not further escalate it, but if you will de-escalate the argument, by you controlling your temper, controlling your tone, and controlling your words, and responding in a calm, controlled manner. Will that help to turn away wrath? Yes. Always? Every time? Well, no, because there's another, there's another person involved in the argument. All right? So here, here's a verse for you. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, there you go. That's a guarantee, right? It's a guarantee that when you train up a child in the way that child should go, that he will never depart from it, right? 
because that's in the Bible. Proverbs are general truths about life. Could they go a different direction? Yes. Why? Because they involve people. And when people are involved, you can't always control the other people. Who can you control? Can you control your soft answer? Yes. And that's the whole point. The whole point is what can I control? I can control the soft answer. I can control how I raise my child. Can I control what my child does after I have raised them? Can't control that. Can I control what somebody else does if I respond in a soft, controlled, calm way? No, I can't control it. So there are general truths that God says, here's how we need to live, here's how we need to behave, here's how we need to treat others um, to, have a, uh, to have a happy, to have a godly, to have a successful uh, life and serving Him. So, any questions, comments? That, that was my quick, that took longer than I wanted it to. That was my quick introduction to the book of Proverbs. Any thoughts or comments on that? We're going to look at verse 7 for the rest of the class. we got 10 minutes. All right. What does verse 7 say? Verse 7 is a key verse here, and that's why I want to spend a few minutes looking at it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. knowledge. Okay, here's, here's a key to understand when you're reading the book of Proverbs, and, and the Bible for that, for, the, for that matter, but we're talking about the book of Proverbs. When you, read the book of, when you read the word knowledge here in verse 7, this is not a knowledge that he's talking about just knowing facts and information. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of memorizing the books of the Bible. If you would just fear the Lord, you'd be able to memorize the books of the Bible. Is that what he's talking about? Well, that's knowledge. If you've memorized the books of the Bible, that's knowledge. It's not, it's not talking about merely knowing facts and information. When you read the word knowledge here and throughout the book of Proverbs, what it's talking about is having an intimate relationship with God and making a total commitment to God. Take this word out of here for just a second. Take it into Genesis uh, and read about Adam and Eve. Take it into Matthew and read about Joseph and Mary. Take it into a number of other places in the Bible where it talks about a husband knowing his wife. Is that usually talking about, well, yes, I know her. I know her name. I know her birth date. I know our anniversary because I have a reminder set on my phone so that I don't forget it again. And I know how tall she is, and I know, I know facts. Is that, is that what it's talking about when it says a husband knowing his wife? No, you know it's talking about something more intimate than that. Take that and don't, don't, make, it, don't, make, it, don't make it perverted, but take that and apply it to when I have knowledge of God, it's not talking about do I just have no facts about God. Do I have verses memorized? It's talking about being in an intimate relationship with God where I have made a total commitment to Him. Have I done that? So ask the question tonight, do I know God? Ask yourself, do I know God? Not, not have I heard about Him, not you know, have I read about Him in the Bible. Do I know Him? Um, the, book of, uh, uh, the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 4 uh, in verse 6, you may know this verse. God says, my people are destroyed for lack of... Oh, you do know that verse. Okay, good. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Uh, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, it goes on to say. God's people, when Hosea is writing that, are, uh, are turning away from him, going eventually into captivity. They're being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Is that lack of knowledge only simply they don't know God's name and where God lives and uh, what God has done in history? Is that just missing the facts? And the, I don't, it, it could be. It could involve that they don't know all of the facts and the information. But there's more to it. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they lack the, the understanding they need to have, but they lack that intimate relationship that they need to have with God. And so ask, my, ask yourself again tonight, do I know God? 
Now, how does this verse say, I come to know God? How does this verse say, I come to be in an intimate relationship where I've made a total commitment to God? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of that. So what does this mean, the fear of the Lord? When we read fear of the Lord, when you read the word fear, usually, even especially outside the context of the Bible, when you read the word fear, you think of being afraid of something, being uh, horrified uh, by something. Is that, when you read about the fear of the Lord, is it talking about being in terror of God, being horrified by God, being afraid of God? Well, no. But I'm not sure I would completely remove all elements of that. Let me, let me, see, let me see if I can help to kind of show this. And uh, the stuff we're talking about, most of this stuff in this class is uh, a friend of mine, Drew Kaiser, wrote a book on the book of Proverbs. And so the, these, are his, these are his four points, but I, th I think there's some validity to this. Just talking about the development of fear in the life of a, of a follower of God. And, and it starts with a natural fear. And, and what, what we mean by that is when you first hear Jesus died for your sins. He went to the cross, died for your sins. He was buried and raised again. He died for your sins because your sins separate you from God. Your sins separate you from God here, and if you don't do anything about it, you're going to go to hell. Does going to hell scare you? It better. I mean, that's why God put it in the Bible. I mean, he didn't put it there to make, give, you, give you warm fuzzies and say, oh, that sounds lovely. Uh, no, God put hell in the Bible to scare us. So is it a natural thing when i read uh when jesus says fear fear not those who can kill only the body but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell matthew 10 and verse 28 should i be afraid of hell <laughs> you better believe i should all right so somebody becomes a christian because they've learned about hell and that their sins will send them to hell but jesus died for their sins so now i can become a christian get rid of my sins and i don't have to go to hell they became a Christian. I'm not saying this is the total reason they did. But sometimes somebody might become a Christian out of natural fear. I don't want to go to hell. Is that a good reason to become a Christian? Shake your head. This, I, I, we're, we're, somebody might fight on that. Well, that's not a good reason to become a Christian. Okay. You say, I need to become a Christian to go to heaven. Yes. But I need to, go to, I need to become a Christian so I don't go to hell. Did they preach about sins in the New Testament? Yeah, they preached about sin all the time. Well, what's the consequences of sin? Hell. So, all right, so, but here's this development. Do I need to stay? Here's the point. When, when the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, I'm not saying when you read the fear of the Lord, it doesn't involve this, but it's not only this. Because your natural fear of God needs to grow. It needs to develop and move into a, a more productive fear, meaning that you have... Once, once you've learned more about God and you've actually read the Bible and you've come to a better understanding of things uh, regarding God and Jesus and, uh, and His plan for you, then the book of Proverbs and all of these verses in the book of Proverbs talk about that this person grows to the point where they, they're now turning away from evil. Now, they did that in order to become a Christian, but the more they learn about evil, the more they turn away from it. When you become a Christian, do you know every sin that there is? Do you know everything that there is that's a sin? Well, no. Remember what Jesus said? Make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things. Are you still supposed to teach people even after you baptized them? Why? There's a lot to learn. They don't know everything yet. So after somebody becomes a Christian, do they still learn, oh, that's a sin? I didn't realize that. Yeah. And so the more I progress the more I realize I want to turn away from evil. I want to be right with God. Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 119, verse 104, David says, uh, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. The more I learn the Bible, the more I hate everything that's evil. So this fear is, 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 is moving, is building, but then it becomes what, what Drew calls an awesome fear. 
where then I just start to think about God and I just stand in awe of God. I stand in awe of what God has done. And, and I, realize, I realize that he's done this for me. And all of, this, all of this basically progresses to the point where I develop a reverent fear for God. And what a reverent fear is, is it's just, it, it is a deep, loving respect where I completely submit myself to God. Not because I fear hell. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go to hell. But I'm not completely submitting myself to God and reverently submitting myself to God because I'm afraid of hell. I'm doing it because I love God. I'm doing it because I am so grateful for what He has done for me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge, not facts and information. It's the beginning of a tight relationship with God. How tight is my relationship with God. Maybe I need to back up and say, where am I in these stages of fear? Have I progressed beyond just being afraid of going to hell and that's why I'm a Christian? Have I developed this deep reverence and respect for my God that I have matured into the point where, you know what? It's not that I have to do these things as a Christian. It's that I want to do them. I get to do them to serve my God and to please my God. And when I develop that reverent fear, what did Solomon say, wise man, at the end of a book of Ecclesiastes? What's the duty of man? The whole duty of man. Two things. Fear God, keep His commandments. Do I keep His commandments because I'm afraid of Him and I'm terrorized by Him and horrified by Him? No. I mean, you, I, I can. That's not a very good relationship though, is it? Do you want your kids to obey you because they're afraid of you? Yes, yes, yes yep, yep, David, I'm not, that's what I want. I want them to be afraid of me, and so they're going to do what I say. Do you want that relationship to eventually develop into a relationship where they love and respect you, and that's why they do what you ask them to do? Yeah, what is that? That's a progression, that's a growth. And so we need to look at ourselves and say, where am I? Where am I in that growth process? All right. I wanted to get a ton done tonight, and I think we did, maybe too much. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's been beneficial for us. Richard will start his class on prayer in here uh, next Wednesday night. So we are dismissed.